husband of her often saw her not as the woman as the little replica of his wife, but really as as a woman. And he keep a shaft of light going from his back door to that little shack. And so there were many little children that came by at the same time. Remember this man that she is living with, and I say that because in that the early period they were not permitted to marry. And even if they were permitted to marry, it still occurred. This man couldn't do anything about it. So you can begin to see how this white man might think that the under the whip and at the, the threat of death, this black man better not touch a white woman. And so if then this man thinks this way, he begins to, to conjure up in his mind the fact that the black man wants to have sexual intercourse with his wife or with his daughters. Well, my daughter and my wife would not want to have that animal. Therefore, he would have to rape her. He would have to coerce her. She would not willingly really go to bed with that black man, that animal. So here we come up to the whole historical business of, of black men, particularly in the South, being afraid to even lift their head up because they were passing a white woman because often this woman yelled rape. And this man, was, he died. <laughs> he was beaten. He died. So when they wanted to get rid of black men throughout the history of this country, they've been able to yell rape in terms of a white woman. And he has died. So at the same time, then, our Christianity has taught us that sexual intercourse was permissible in the framework of, of a marriage. And then it was bad outside of that. And yet we were able as human beings to relate one to the other. And we'd go through all these petty processes, you know, and get all stirred up. We didn't went out able to do anything about it. How many of you young men or, or young girls I should ask, there's a thing going out now that um, Young men are saying, you know, you really got to help me out. You know, you don't want me to become a, a homosexual. <laughs> you can't imagine bad. I'm going to be a bad and go on. <laughs> the other thing is they're using saran wrap. You heard about that? Can't buy them prophylactics and then pills and things. So they're using saran wraps and doctors are having a real time. Headaches. Saran wrap girls are using stupid things like uh, seven up <laughs> you brought it up <laughs> I see it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and some of the girls are using the content some there is um, a means of getting rid of those little things and make babies call sperm. Yes, that's the main thing. So we're saying, basically, when we had any hesitation, she would have said they use it as a dust. <laughs> <laughs> so I have now given you kind of a historical um, perspective of this, and I now feel that maybe the, the other two can give their points of view. Then we can talk when they're Well, I'm here mainly to integrate the panel. The, uh, <laughs> and uh, the particular thing I hear is just tangentially related to, uh, to sex and uh, and raised. I happen to have three children at home. If they haven't burned the place down by now, they're all rioters. The, uh, but uh, we have two two girls and a boy. And last summer, a neighbor was walking by and said to my blonde daughter, "My, your brother has a nice tan, doesn't he?" And my daughter put out any time her brother's praise. Says, "Yes, but he is Negro, you know, and they are darker." <laughs> the, uh, uh, 
but uh, so so I'm 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 on because of uh, we have a mixed racial family, and we adopted Michael after we adopted two Caucasian girls, mainly because we lacked the courage to do it the first two times. You know, we had thought about and talked about, but like like most white families. Uh, we were wondering, you know, a little bit, what would people say and what would the in-laws say because my father is prejudiced and Audrey's folks are from North Dakota and they, you know... <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that they're prejudiced, it's that they've, never, they've just never seen, you know, a <laughs> Negro. They don't allow them except at the Air Force, the Air Force base, but we, but we, finally, we finally adopted Michael. And we did not we did not adopt Michael because we thought, you know, we were going to give him a great life. Being my son is not you know, no guarantee <laughs> of a great life. We adopted we adopted Michael because we thought in, in this society we needed Michael more probably than he needed us. But the truth is of course is there are babies, they need adoption, many of them are racially mixed. Now the the problems we have faced so far are just really nothing at all. But we know that in his lifetime, Michael, because he is part Negro, is going to face hatred, he's going to face bitterness, he's going to be insulted. What are we going to do about this as, as parents? Well, there's really very little we can do except to try and give Michael proud, some pride in his white heritage and pride in his black heritage. And he is going to somehow make his own adjustment of being in a society which is white and black, of being both. The real problems will come of course, when Michael hits high school and college. Who is he going to date, you see? The, uh, and who is he going to marry? Do you think Michael should date only whites, only blacks, or that he could make it his duty to find those who are also of mixed racial parentage, but who really knows? Michael will have to make his own decision, but so far as anyone asking us, Michael can date anyone he pleases. You know, anyone who will go out with him, or you know, the uh, anyone he feels like asking. If boys are still asking girls, the uh, <laughs> by the time Michael hits it, when it comes to marriage, is fine. You know, Michael again will make his own choice. Obviously, as most young people do, he wants to marry. You know, pure white, pure black, or in between. That is Michael's choice, and it's certainly all right with us. But the problem is going to have to be faced. But the reason I'm here is because I think probably most of you think, you know, when you think about marriage, the, most of you think of producing little babies just like yourself. But I would suggest that what we need is not, you know, girls going out and producing five and six babies, you see. It's what we need are people who are willing to adopt. After you have your first or second baby, why not consider adoption? And if you consider adoption, why not consider a racially mixed? Adoption, or if you find out that you that you're going to adopt anyway, and you and you cannot make your first adoption racially mixed, adopt your second or your third one racially mixed. Be willing to be willing to consider that. There are families in this town which could have natural children, and instead have adopted with mixed families, some Caucasian, some racially mixed. One family we know of, and I admire the person's perseverance if nothing else, has seven children, one natural. Six children adopted, uh, all six racially mixed. The other, the other day we were at a meeting of, of families who have adopted racially mixed children, and, uh, and one lady said that when, since so many times these kids get shoved around from foster home to foster home, that when, when they finally got their little girl, she came to them and she said, my last mummy didn't want me, I hope that you will want me. This was a little, you know, two and a half year old. And since she is now adopted, you know, she was wanted. I don't want to, you know, just end with, with a sad story to end with a sad story. But these, these kids are there and they need to be adopted. Now, if you say, well, why doesn't the black community adopt them? You already, I think, are revealing some kind of, of deep prejudice, which all of us whites, I think, have. And that is, of course, is why should the black community adopt those children who are racially mixed? Why should the black community even adopt those children who are black except that they want to and as they have economic means? In our society, it is so often the whites who have the economic means. You know, this is the result of discrimination and prejudice. But the child who is racially mixed, it seems to me, is a child who is in need of a home. And the person who does not feel that he can provide a home for that racially mixed child, then I think has, has some really deep, deep uh, hang-up.
Well, that's that's my little pitch. I also have some views on the rest of the uh, game, if you want to ask. I might start off by saying that I don't know a whole lot about sex, but I do know a whole lot about racism. And racism, like any other ism, is more of a discipline than anything else. We know for a fact, from just looking around us, that wherever whites and people of color, I can't say only black, because then I'm excluding a great many other colors, coexist in the same geographic area. There exists a system of white racism, which distorts reality to a, an unrecognizable degree. I think in this country, one of the ways that it manifests, manifests itself is in the sexual relations of not only white women and black men, but more important, white men and black women, because there are really only two free peoples in this country. That's the white male and the black female. If you want to talk about what racism has done, look at prostitution. Look at the vast number of black girls that go out onto the street to sell to who? That white man, that nice middle class man who has such dis distorted views of what sex is all about. He feels he can't do it to his wife unless he's going to have kids. And once you have so many kids, you begin to feel that you can't afford anymore. And it's biological necessity. We all get horny. So he goes out onto the street and picks up a black woman. And the blacker the better. What's that old saying down south? The blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice. And they believe it. But what's this doing to the white female? More important, what's it doing, more important to me? totally selfishly. What's it doing to that black man? It's destroying them both in a sense. It's taking away the manhood of the, of the black man and certainly taking away the femininity of the, of the white female because you white women have been put up on a pedestal by your men, which is detrimental to you because these needs aren't fulfilled. The man can do whatever he pleases. If he feels the urge in the middle of the night, he always comes down to Plymouth Avenue, and I've seen them lined up. When I was a kid going to Warrington, they used to stop me coming from school, asking me where they could go find a woman. And I'd tell them to go rap on the second garbage can. They'd give me a dollar and stand there and wait. <laughs> Now this is the sort of thing it does. I think two things have to be attacked. Two things have to be really evaluated in this system. And I don't want to take the time to evaluate them orally at the moment. One is that system of racism. It's got to be destroyed. The other is your own interpretation of what sex is all about. Sex is the logical extension of, of any male to female feeling, I think. If you, if you stifle it, you become very frustrated. You don't see too many black homosexuals walking the streets. You don't see too many black kids masturbating. You don't see too many black kids walking around totally hung up about sex. That doesn't happen in our culture. It does happen in yours. I at one time considered myself a member of the intelligentsia, which was a mistake. Not because I'm not intelligent enough, because it, but because the intelligentsia has absolutely nothing to offer me. 
and a group of friends and I, all nice middle class white kids, used to sit around and talk about sex all the time, constantly. And I began to get, you know, 13, 14, 15, and found that there was really no sense in talking about it. <clears throat> you know, it's not something that you sit down and rap about. It's an active thing. It's a participation sport, not an observer sport, and not a commentator sport. And this is the thing that you've made it. It's fine to talk about sex now, but it's not all right to show your feeling one person to another by indulging in intercourse. And I think it's far more dangerous if you don't. People keep talking about the high illegitimacy rate among black people. And these people come from areas of town where they give abortions in every holiday station. You can't talk about an illegitimate child. There's no such thing as an illegitimate human being. Illegitimacy is something that you punish. It's a crime. It's something that you put people in jail for. And what the hell are you going to do with this kid once he's had? Send him back? Out of the question. So you have to start to redefine your terms. You have to start to reevaluate your entire moral system. Because it's the women that are getting left out. And they're beginning to get smart. They're beginning to realize that since historically that white man has used that black women, woman, they are now beginning to use that black man and paying for it. You'd be amazed at the number of your, probably some of your classmates, who come down to Plymouth Avenue, get picked up by a man, and give him all he wants, all the money, just to go to bed with her every now and then. This says something about your system. It says a great deal about the way you handle things. Because while the, the husband may be over north, his wife could be someplace over south. So you're destroying yourself with this totally inane system of, of false values, denying everything that's basically human. And I think that, that sex isn't something you learn. You don't have instruction in it. I think it's something basic to all human beings. I can't say that, that I blame the system of racism for your, your false views. But sexually, in regard to the black man, the black woman, it is racism combined with your values that have kept us down in part for a long, long time. Yeah, uh as might be expected, I didn't agree with everything Sumner said, but I, I think a, a basic part of his analysis is right. I think that in our society, first first by by making the, fe the female Negro black available to the white in the South, and there's some hangover in the North, that she became sexually charged, and and that the uh, as as the as the white man divided women, because we want at the same time. The male wants to put women on a pedestal, and he also wants to put them in bed. That's the two places, you see. And, and the white woman got on the pedestal, and the Negro woman got into the bed, you see, mentally. Now, and of course, as the Negro male was denied to the white female, the Negro male got sexually charged with, with the racist attitude that here was a person who was more close to being animal, more close to being beast. He suggested the primitive nature of sex. Thus, in our society, I think both the, the, the black male and the black female are now sexually charged. I think it's probably getting better as things loosen, as things loosen up. But I think that the, the charge is both there. And with my suspicious mind, it seems to me this is why these dark stockings are so terribly popular, since they suggest, as when I see a, a girl walk in these dark stockings, they suggest that she's white from the waist up and black from the waist down. You know, those of you who buy the stockings may disagree, but this is the way. This is the way 
I happened to read it. As several girls pull down their... Uh, they, uh, okay, I'll turn it back to Mary now. That was just one. I want to make two comments, and uh, then I'll throw it open, open to questions. One of these is that um, you would have the task of finding a needle in a haystack to find a black person. Uh, Lillian's pretty dark, but I dare say she's not African. And I don't think Sumner is either, and I can't, you know, get his look. Um, this is not all by virtue of miscegenation, as it's been called, erroneously. Um, it started out on the African slave ships coming over. And uh, you also know that you didn't come over and uh, find us and, uh, you know, win the war and bring us over. We sold ourselves to you. So we had a few of these little uh, problems before you got there. One tribe went to another tribe, and then they took that tribe down and uh, posted them, you know, along the coastline. Who do you want to buy? Here you are. Uh, the other thing is that in terms of this development of the idea of the Negro male being beautiful, and I know how I got on this panel. I made a statement a couple of years ago and somebody remembered it. Uh, and somebody in the audience at one of these discussions of the film said, um, well, the Negro male is, uh, is such a beautiful sexual animal. I said, that's a myth. Uh, I, I, I don't know about all of them. Um, the, uh, but it kind of left that taste. The idea was that you wanted good, strong people to work in the uh, cotton fields. So how do you get them? You find a good, strong Negro male, and you match him up. You use him just like you do a horse, as a stud. And the idea was perpetu perpetuated that, uh, you know, they, they kept producing these lovely strong babies and uh, used them in the fields and the others they put in the house. And by the way, those that were in the house, the, the uh, Negro women, I happen to prefer the word Negro, I don't know where it's going eventually, person of color or anything else. Um, those that were used in the house as housemaids uh, were also used in the house as concubines with the knowledge quite often of the white female. And the children who were produced, we developed a, a class society too, you know. The children that were produced were of mixed color, lighter than the ones in the fields. And the fathers, the master of the household, took an interest in these children who were produced and educated them. And those that were educated among the Negroes became the landed gentry as such when uh, uh, slavery was abolished on the books at least. Uh, the others in the fields uh, turned into the majority of the uh, Negroes, and they're the ones who are represent poor people, the major majority of the poor people. Um, I am, I think the word Negro has to be defined as representing anyone of mixed heritage with a darker hue than that normally uh, acquired through a suntan. If you go in the background of most of the people who belong to the Afro-American Negro group, you'll find um, many Indian uh, ancestors, you'll find many North European ancestors, and you'll find many Afro-American or African ancestors. Uh, okay, what are some of the questions that got raised? Except they nodded your heads very nicely. Uh, do you accept everything? Yes. Well, I would rather that he um, said it. Second go round.
I grew up in the South, and uh, it, it took me a long time to understand what was happening to the people around me. Um, and there was something hysterical about the way they responded on the race issues. My own friends that I grew up in school with. And um, I started out with the initial assumption that most hysteria is a result of something sexual. This is probably a bad assumption to make. The psychologists can point that out. But anyway, with the Negro, the way I explained it to myself was the reason they were scared and hysterical um, about integration was that it was the promise of the end to a way of life. And this way of life was to live loving oneself and yet have the possibility Saturday night to get drunk and go down to shanty town, go down to the black section and uh, have the fling to be evil for a while and to step back into the beautiful world. And this to me was why integration was such a threat to this moment. And I was wondering if the panel felt this was the case too. I think what he has said is uh, give some credence uh, to my assumption uh, from the beginning of the whole business of life being bad and evil and life being good and pure. Uh, and we all recognize that we're a little bit of both. Um, and But then it's a pity that um, we cannot get to the place where we can look at another human being and recognize that what we enjoy with another human being does not necessarily have to be a taste of evil or, or badness. But that this is a way to be more of a human being. And I think this white male who has sought out the black woman, I certainly agree with everything that Sonia has said. I think he did it very well. Um, but here is this, this white man who wants to be a human being, who, who wants to enjoy a complete sexual relationship. The pity is, is that he cannot enjoy that sexual relationship with the Caucasian uh, female because of, of having put her on this pedestal, or that the female has not learned uh, that she can also enjoy the sexual uh, life. And I think this is one of the things that the black woman, uh, those who don't have too many middle class hang up, does do. And I think that this kind of abandonment, which many of us um, have not been really taught. And this is the only place, I don't think you learn sex, uh, Sumner, but I do think we learn how to be emotional human beings. I do think that we learn how to, to, to abandon ourselves. And I think in going to Shantytown, there was great abandonment. Now you come to some of our parties, there is great abandonment. We laugh, we yell, we, we, we the food is, is a part of it. There's great joy. There's great merriment. When we go to some of these white parties, everybody just kind of standing around with that glass. <laughs> and all these intellectual hang-ups. And there is no abandonment. Now, we're beginning to sense it a little bit with Funky Broadway <laughs> uh, and the new dances. It's a new kind of abandonment which I think is very healthy for all the groups that are beginning to dance these dances. Did, did I respond? Did you understand the way I'm responding? I'm, I'm agreeing with what he's saying. I'm trying to amplify it a little bit to say that you do have to learn to feel, and you do have to learn then to respond appropriately <laughs> to a sex mate, appropriately. And that was not an appropriate response. I, I agree fully, but I'd like to, to raise just, you know, one very complex oh, question. I want to catch him on one. I, I thought I wanted to catch him up. Why, why did you constantly refer to adopting a mixed racial child? Then I thought, now that's his racism. Because why should this child have to be mixed? Why couldn't this child be black? Why couldn't this child be from two black parents? Uh, 
know, I don't know about that. I just, but he, he stressed that, you know, you stressed it each yeah. time. And so I'm like, no. Well, the, uh, as I understand it, one thing to pass the buck is the welfare department usually places in a, in a Caucasian home a, uh, a mixed child rather, rather than a, uh, a black child. And uh, since, since I know that in, in part of white races, having, having a mixed child makes it a little bit easier with in-laws and with, with other people. The, uh, uh, we we got a child that happened happened to be light, and I suppose he'll 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 face the problem of uh, of passing. You know, he, he can uh, you know he wants to call himself Italian with the last name of Paul Aceri, You know, <laughs> they, uh, a kid a kid a kid you know if if he has a racial hang up and then he has that last name you know he's done. The uh, but uh, our next our next child may be uh, maybe maybe darker and not and then. It just, it just, uh, the mixed racial amuses me, you see, because if, if someone asks you, you expect to have problems, I usually say, well, since since Michael's biological mother was half Swedish, probably will, you see. <laughs> but uh, oh, to, to raise to raise to raise the the, the problem which which uh, Miss Anthony suggested, you know, one one thing we don't know is is how much granted that the white middle class is a kind is a kind of a, a hung up class. But how much this impulse control is not tied to, to our economic, uh, you know, kind of development. We have depended in, in the Caucasian race, we have depended for a considerable amount of time for young people putting off the fulfillment of their sexual drive and channeling that into education or into hard work, you know. The, uh, uh, the reason you're such good students, you see, well, let's not go into that. The, uh, but uh, but this whole this whole thing of the the middle class depending upon impulse control for economic satis satisfaction is a very complex issue, you know. And I just wanted to suggest it because it relates to this whole question of, of what kind of lifestyle should should one have. And of course, I don't think that when we talk about a free emotional lifestyle, we mean you know laying everybody. But I rather think it is a quality of life that really uh, you know can vary a great deal as to how the individual approaches it. But still, there's a freedom, which uh, which is a kind of I think an ideal. I never worked at all, and I, I never changed that. I wanted to teach him because it was the easiest possible thing I, I could think of. I, I think that your answer, the conclusion that you came to, is a good explanation. But I think realistically it's probably only part what's really going on. I can't imagine the fear of black people as being one that is only sexual. There is the fear of, uh, of our reaping revenge upon you for all the things that you have done to us in the past. It's a good excuse to say, I don't want this guy living next door to me. Because I know damn well that come sundown, he's going to sneak into my daughter's bedroom window. I think that the, the sexual thing is, is convenient. No longer can, can they call us animals. Because proportionately, we're the most educated people in, in the country. We don't stop at, at bachelor's degrees. You go all the way, and then get that job on the post office with three or four PhDs, which, which gives us really a great deal of insight into mail sorting. Uh, so I think that, that that what we're dealing with is a total dehumanization of black people over the past. What was 1611 or something when they first came here? Yeah. And we're trying to fight that rather than just the sexual attitude. So I don't think that your your friends in the South were worry about losing a place to go to because they can always get prostitution. Prostitution is about the oldest institution in in the world. Whenever a woman wanted something of a man, she would damn well how to get it. And 
and what, what prostitutes date commonly is money. And that's all. And that's a very small price for your neighbors to pay for, for all of this sexual gratification that they can't get any other way. So I don't think they're worried about losing prostitutes. They're, they're more worried. They're, they're just using that as an excuse because they've got a conception of what a black person is all about. And they just don't want us near him for any reason. Because we're inhuman. And sex is a good excuse to you. To the pigmentation in the skin um, enabled them to withstand it. All right, now here's a nice situation. We want to keep it this way because it's economically ne necessary. Uh, now, we have to build up a set of myths so that we can maintain the situation as it is. One of the things we have to do is break down any culture. So the only place in which the, the slaves could congregate was in the church. And we tell them that, uh, you know, it'll be a better world next time. Uh, you should sing and relax and enjoy yourself and be free in the church under God, etc. And this is where this abandonment idea uh, was based also, right in the church. This was the only time. You go to church from Sunday morning to Sunday night. Lots of poor people do that too, by the way. Uh, the rural community did it, the poor people still do it, and church starts at 10 in the morning or 9 in the morning with prayers, etc., and ends at 4 in the afternoon uh, for dinner or supper or in time to get home. Um, the, the idea of miscegenation grew up as a protection. We have to keep separate races. Uh, if uh, white and Negro marry or white and African marry or white and African um, cohabitate, then there will be a decrease in intelligence and in strength, uh, increase in diseases, etc. Most of the diseases that we have, we got from you. Um, this has, a, there's, there's an idea that I have. I don't know how good it is. We probably lost a lot of it. But I think on the whole that the health of the Negro is pretty darn good because the only ones who could survive getting over here on the slave ships were adaptable and were strong. Otherwise, we would have long since that out. We'd never have made it to the fields. Now, over the period of time, since we have intermarried or, quote, intermarried by accident, uh, we may have lost a lot of this strength. But I think this is another point. But the whole thing is that most of the ideas, and all of the ideas uh, that have supported racism uh, have been a matter of necessity in order to maintain the economy. And all we're trying to do now is get some facts inserted into the mythology and get rid of the myth. Are you going to sit there quietly and take everything we have to say? Yes. <laughs> It is. It's, it's been substantiated by, by studies. Uh, masturbation is just sort of a mechanical outlet for, for a sexual drive. Homosexuality 
is something that I, I don't really understand. But it's been explained to me as a rejection of one sex because of various things. Uh, the way you've been taught to view females, the sexual act with females. So you've got no, no recourse. You know, there are only two sexes. <laughs> It, 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 you've already eliminated one, you've got to turn to the other, so that's homosexuality. I, at one time, when I was studying biology, thought that people were taught to be heterosexual, but you aren't. It's, it's a basic instinct. Heterosexuality is basic to all animals. Thank goodness. <laughs> which which breeds homosexuality and masturbation and, and sexual perversion? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. In our culture, we we face sex for what it is: puberty. That time when young men climb trees and young women dig holes in the ground and things. In, in your society, it's a very trying time. I went to a, a predominantly white high school. I mean, you, you could almost call it all white. And went to some parties during the time I was becoming sexually aware, or aware of my sexuality. And they put us like in a basement from 8 to midnight with a candle going. And the mother would come down every now and then and check on us, bringing us cookies. And, and uh, at midnight, after we were all aroused, really sexually aroused. Speaking of sexual charging, man, I had enough to start a semi-truck. <laughs> you know. And then they'd send us home. Say goodnight. <laughs> Shake hands with your partner and, and go on your lonely way. Now, what happens during puberty is puberty is a time where, where parents consider the fact that their child is growing up, so they provide them with all sorts of things, like the dark basements, and, and like the parks. But, man, they ain't a cotton sight. You reach a certain point, and then it's cut off. Now, that's bound to cause some sort of frustration. I'm, I'm advocating honesty. I'm advocating, you know, everybody to his own thing, you know, at, at their own particular time. I'm, I'm advocating reality, which isn't necessarily free love. I haven't under, ever understood the, the concept of free love. It seemed to me, you know, outlawing prostitution and making them go out there for nothing. That's about as close as I ever came to explaining free love. But I think what's happening now is a denial of, of human sexuality, which can't possibly be healthy. I am not sure that I can really help you, but I am trying to understand some of these things. I've read several books, and some excellent books are by Theodore Reich. One is called Love and Lust. Um, and 700 some pages work. But he attempts in this book uh, to explain how through puberty the, the, the male child relates to the, the mother. Example, here you have been coddled by the mother, you've been loved by her, all that, you know all that. And then suddenly you're told you know, can no longer relate that way to your mother. And so 
this brings a lot of uh, hang-ups. Now, in the black community, then how is this different? That's what you're really asking. Well, I think there are several things that are different in, in, in the black community. One is that both mother and father usually have to work to sustain the family. Or there are enough siblings in the family so that there is not this over emphasis in terms of coddling and holding. And therefore, the child then can relate more to others. So I don't think that many of the black children come up having sexual, actual sexual intercourse any sooner than the Caucasian children. But I think their mental psyche about it is not mystical. It's a thing. You know, everybody knows it goes on. Well, I remember when I was uh, 11 years old, I came home from school, and I just said to uh, Mom, you know, I don't understand what the kids are talking about. We were sitting on the curb today, and I was talking to some girls, and they started talking about ministration. My father dropped a spoon. And he said, because we always had family counsel around the table. And Daddy dropped his spoon. I thought, uh oh. <laughs> this is a thing. So then we, Mama said, well, we'll talk about it later. But well, then my little brother, who's six years younger, said, why can't we talk about it now? And then my sister said, yeah, what is that word you use? And so right there, we started dealing with it at the table. And then we continued. And uh, with, with my father, when the whole biological process came from me, it was my father who was the one who was able to do this. And I think because we don't have all of these sophisticated standards to go by, then we, I think, are, this abandonment, this freedom is, is intrinsic in our culture, you see. That, and I don't, it's hard for me to get this over to you. It may be, it, I wouldn't say lower class, I'm changing my vocabulary, I hope you begin to change yours. Uh, in terms of the economic base, people who have less money, then I think find uh, more ingenious ways to have entertainment. You know, we have great whist parties, great food parties, uh, great record parties, great joke sharing parties. Uh, because we, we cannot afford to go, huh? Yeah. Uh, the whole business, uh, we don't can, didn't have the money to go to the nightclubs and all of these other things. So I think we had to be a little more ingenious in how we enjoyed ourselves. And I think we were more communal in, in, in family and, and, and community. When you're talking about standards of class, you're automatically talking about standards for what you consider low-income whites because we live so closely together. I mean, a, a ghetto, a black community is simply a community that, that whose life result revolves around the black culture, which includes whites. See, because you won't let them live with you out in Edina because they can't afford to. See? So they live with us in North Minneapolis and Harlem. See? And our values are the same. So we aren't talking about only black people, we're talking about you know, Mexican Americans, uh, whatever else happens to be poor. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure they would. It, it is, from the outset, you see, what happens is that we get hung up in this striving thing the same as all of you students do. And the only way we can prove to you that we are strivers is by accepting all your values. Never eat watermelon. Never. Never go to bed with anyone. And, and deny personally all of the myths that, that have been created about black people. So it's on an individual level that, that this thing occurs. But the mass of black people accept black culture, I mean, the majority, simply because we have no choice. 
and those of us who do have a choice and recognize the choice realize realize what each culture is all about tend to go back because it's more honest there i just want to emphasize the fact that there's an economic you know uh, explanation for many of these things. At, at least people in this kind of economic group tend to behave in this kind of way. And I don't think it, I don't think it's necessarily a racial, a racial thing at all. But when you have a when you have a Negro uh, subculture, then you have certain patterns. But what, one thing that kind of uh, bothers me is that you know middle class white. And I hope this isn't a thing. But I'm, I'm not so sure that, that uh, masturbation is all that bad. You know, I, mean, I don't I don't know if you should hold it up as a, as a kind of uh, a kind of perversion. And the, the incident of masturbation is so terribly high among among unmarried uh, males who are not who are not having intercourse with both lower class and middle class and upper class. It really doesn't you know when we get into that kind of statistics, it's not worth getting uh, excited about. And you certainly, I mean, we all know too that we that you certainly have uh, Negro homosexuals as well as white homosexuals. That's not a that's that's not a uh, a race thing too. But it, it is it is a thing oftentimes related to the kind of uh, the kind of family. And there's a word which is used for, for Negro class, uh, middle class Negroes in some places, which is strainers. You know, they're kind of straining to stay up in, in the middle class. And uh, I, I kind of laugh out in the suburbs because I, I, have a, I have a Negro friend out there who has to keep his lawn in great shape, you know. And when I go off and play golf and tennis, I always look at him out there sweating on that lawn, you know, they, and hope the kids have chewed some way by the time I get back. We were taught that it was right because this was a way to reproduce so we could be more available as slaves. It's interesting when the Catholic Church changes uh, tone, everybody changes, <laughs> and it's definitely changed tone. I would like to make a, a comment regarding his point. Um, we're talking about racism now. It does apply economically across the board to all poor people, and the majority of Negroes are poor. So we're talking about the poor man in general when we talk about uh, the Negro. With most of the things apply across the board, but we are a defined group. And we have certain self-interest right now, so we have to be talking about us. Uh, the march to Washington, that is called the Poor People's March, though. It's not called the Negroes' March. And there are some whites in that march. Um, the, the talk about guaranteed annual income, the impetus came from our big push in the 1950s and still going on. Um, a lot of people are going to benefit. The middle class is going to benefit as well as the poor class as well as the Negro from what's going on right now. We're busy trying to get the Indians to join us and they look down their noses at us for a long time and now one by one they're getting in on the group, you know, because it's it's uh, becoming, what, um, profitable in not just the economic sense, but profitable to be identified because we're bigger and we can do a little more so they join in and, and benefit as well. Yeah, great.
it doesn't really matter who you're going to bed with. If you have a kid, it's wrong. And it's interesting. It's, it's interesting what's happened. As you people start waking up to sex, and you have, your parents make available to you if they find that you insist upon being a sexual animal. They make available to you all sorts of contraceptive devices, all sorts of uh, birth control pills, that sort of thing. So we're wondering what's really wrong. You know, is it wrong to have a kid, or is it wrong to go to bed with somebody? And if we find that it's wrong to have a kid, then it definitely is wrong to go to bed with somebody, because that's what it's all about. Uh, I've known several girls on Plymouth that have had kids without being married. And the proudest person is that father. Not only a, a matter of egotism in that he sees a part of himself, but that is his son. And he goes places with his son. I don't care if the guy is only 18 years old. He takes care of that boy if he has a chance, or that girl. Whereas I've seen guys that have been in the same position, white guys from, from middle class families and all of that. And they deny it. You know, that's not my kid. Hell, I never had a kid in my life. Of course, I'm making general statements because that's the only way you can talk about a group. Which I'm going to use. And one is the whole business of illegitimacy. I thought it was a very beautiful statement and, and the analogy he made about what the word illegitimate means. And then he, you mentioned dehumanization. They go hand in hand. And I think the, the, the way I, I really am beginning to, to realize that semantics is a real hang up for us. And that when we say this is an illegitimate child, we then are taking away the humanity of the child. Um, and I think that's why that child who's black who has the, the, the illegitimate child, the child out of wedlock, can still be loved by the parents that, oh, when they bring the child into the way and I'm there, I want to hold it. And she tells me, you know, uh, uh, I've learned not to ask stupid questions, you know, like who is, is the father or something, something like that. But we all love that child, and I think that's what I'm trying to say in terms of having humanity. And I think this is a great thing that black people have to give to the world. and. Uh, uh, colored people. I don't know about um, other ethnic or racial groups in terms of what they do with their child, but a real example in terms of adoption happened to me when I was in New York last year. A couple adopted a child, and the child uh, was, was brown. But the child had been born of a Jewish young girl, and the family was willing to take that child, and they had taken the child into the home and then as the child, you know, often when we are born, we're much fairer in complexion. And then the child's complexion began to change so that when the child was six months old, they then <coughs> began to accuse her of having had an affair with an Afro-American and she to this day said that she did not. <laughs> so we, um, it's quite possible because it could have been in the family, you see. So again, what difference did it make what color the child was? This is a little human being. These are the kinds of complex things that you've got to begin to struggle with. I saw a free hand flutter, yes. Yeah. 